So the Donald Trump, Bill Barr, loyalists, devotees, lackeys, are the gifts in our federal government that just keep on giving. Let's talk about Michael Sherwin going rogue on 60 Minutes, talking about the ongoing investigation into the attack on the U.S. Capitol and what impact his statements might have on the hundreds of pending criminal investigations. In short, what impact it might have on justice. Because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So now that we know that Michael Sherwin, the former acting DC U.S. attorney, went rogue on 60 Minutes, giving an unauthorized, unapproved, and frankly unethical interview to 60 Minutes about an ongoing investigation, the attack on the U.S. Capitol, let's try to answer three questions. One, what are the implications to Sherwin himself? Two, what are the consequences to the hundreds of pending criminal cases about which Sherwin ran his mouth? And three, why did he do it? Well, regarding the consequences to Sherwin himself, we're already seeing headlines that answer that question. Here's one example, quote, Justice Department investigating prosecutor for interview about Capitol riot cases. Here's another headline. Former Capitol riot prosecutor facing internal investigation after 60 minutes interview. Now, frankly, folks, that is as it should be when a federal prosecutor commits what appears to be misconduct, and he did. He violated a DOJ prohibition against talking about pending cases, ongoing investigations, those allegations are referred to the Department of Justice Office of Professional Responsibility, OPR, for an investigation and, if appropriate, possible sanctions. And those sanctions can be severe. So the other thing that I suggest should happen to Michael Sherwin together with an OPR investigation, is a bar council investigation. Wherever it is he is licensed to practice law in whatever state jurisdiction, state bar council should also open an investigation into what sure seems like a violation, direct violation of DOJ rules that could work to the prejudice of defendants in pending cases. Second question, what are the consequences to the hundreds of pending criminal cases that are now in court involving the attack on the Capitol? Well, the judge that is presiding over the Proud Boy defendants, Judge Mehta in Federal District Court in D.C., is none too pleased, and he ordered an emergency hearing yesterday to basically call the federal government, the, the, the prosecutors, to the carpet over what had just gone on. And here is some of the Washington Post reporting about that. U.S. District Judge Amit Mehta called a surprise hearing Tuesday on six hours notice to discuss his concerns that comments by Michael Sherwin aired on Sunday and a separate article published Monday by the New York Times indicated the Justice Department was not following the court's rules or the agency's internal procedures to refrain from speaking about ongoing cases outside of court. The internal review and the judge's displeasure are an ominous development for Justice Department officials trying to oversee one of the largest criminal investigations in U.S. history, in which more than 300 defendants have already been charged and 100 more are expected to be. Already defense lawyers are trying to use Sherwin's remarks to argue their clients are being treated unfairly. The article continues, At Tuesday's hearing, federal prosecutors admitted there did appear to be a problem. Quote, As far as we can determine at this point, those rules and procedures were not complied with in respect to that 60 Minutes interview. 
and prosecutors have referred the matter to the Justice Department's Office of Professional Responsibility, said John Crabb, chief of the criminal division of the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. And the article continues, quote, no matter how much press attention this matter gets, it will be clear these defendants are entitled to a fair trial, the judge said. The government, quite frankly, in my view, should know better. Close quote. That was a quote from Judge Mehta. So what are the implications to the hundreds of pending criminal cases as a result of Sherwin going rogue and talking about an ongoing investigation detailing evidence that the prosecutors have and don't yet have and suggesting in the future what charges might be brought all so wildly inappropriate and unethical. But I don't think the long-term impact on the cases will be that severe. Here's why I say that. First of all, many of these defendants will end up pleading guilty, I predict. Many of them will end up entering into cooperation agreements because so many of them have said, the only reason I came to the Capitol on January 6th is because Donald Trump told me to. The only reason I went to the Capitol and tried to stop the steal was because that's what Donald Trump told me to do. Many of these defendants have said without his direction, his instructions, I wouldn't have done it. That becomes potentially important evidence in a case against Donald Trump. So I predict many of these defendants will end up pleading guilty. Some of them will cooperate in the prosecution of others as the prosecutors work their way up the food chain. The other thing is because those insurrectionists who choose to go to trial, as is their right, they won't go to trial for many months in the future. So Michael Sherwin's comments on 60 Minutes Sunday night will long be in the rearview mirror, and many of the potential jurors probably won't even have heard of them uh, by the time they're actually involved in jury selection, or if they have, if they did hear them and they recall them, they will probably be able to agree to put it out of their mind while they're, you know, sitting and deciding a case based only on the evidence they hear introduced during the trial itself. So I predict the long-term impact on the pending criminal cases of Michael Sherwin going rogue on 60 Minutes will be minimal. Let's try to answer the third question, or at least um, tackle the third question. Why in the world did Michael Sherman do this? You know, he's a longtime federal government employee. He was a prosecutor, federal prosecutor in Miami before, you know, he caught Donald Trump's attention by prosecuting a trespasser at Mar-a-Lago and got pulled up and, you know, dropped into the District of Columbia as the acting U.S. attorney, a position he obviously was not prepared to, to take on. I think he's proved that. So why might he have done this? Why would he have intentionally violated a bedrock rule about which all federal prosecutors know that prohibits talking about pending investigations? We don't know the answer to that question. Some possibilities are an enormous ego, a terminal case of hubris, maybe trying to catch the attention on uh, of somebody on Fox News so he could land a spot? We don't know. Was it to send signals to people who are being investigated? Perhaps people who haven't yet been arrested? We don't know. But you know, he talked in great detail about evidence they have and evidence they don't have. And boy, the evidence they don't have, this, this is pretty consequential because he said things like, you know what? We have conversations among the insurrectionists, among the defendants about, you know, let's get to the Capitol, let's have a strong showing in DC, let's stop the steal, but we don't have any communications where they said we're, we're intending to breach the Capitol. Boy, if I were an insurrectionist and I hadn't been arrested yet and I knew that I had made statements, had conversations, have communications about breaching the Capitol. I'd sure like to know that the former top prosecutor said they don't have that evidence yet. Maybe that still gives me time 
to delete it. That highlights why prosecutors don't talk about pending investigations or the evidence they do or don't have. But we don't know. Here's the other possibility, because I found it beyond curious that we learned in that 60 Minutes interview that Michael Sherwin went to the rally and went to the insurrection. He said, yeah, I threw on my jogging clothes. I went down to check it out. And he talked about his personal observations at the rally. Then he went to the Capitol and he talked about his personal observations at the Capitol, including people scaling the scaffolding, taking the Capitol. You know what we now call Michael Sherwin? We can call him a lot of things. We can also call him a witness. Because on national TV, he detailed evidence that he saw with his own eyes. That makes him a witness. There's another bedrock principle that prosecutors cannot investigate or prosecute cases where they directly witnessed some of the events being investigated and prosecuted. The other thing Michael Sherwin did by sharing all of his personal observations as an eyewitness, he's now made himself a potential trial witness in every single insurrection case. And if the defendants on trial, the insurrectionists, want to issue a subpoena to Michael Sherwin so they can present him as the defense's first witness at trial, guess what? That is a well-placed subpoena. And Michael Sherwin would have to testify. Why? Because he's an eyewitness. He's already told us that. You know, maybe he just wanted to get in front of the fact that people were going to know he was at the rally that day and he was at the Capitol that day. Um, and so this is his cover story. I don't know. We don't know what motivated him to make these statements, all kinds of possibilities. Only he knows, and only those people that he talked with in advance and perhaps after know. Uh, we know that the people he talked with in advance did not include the Department of Justice officials that he was required to talk to and get approval from if he was going to give an interview to the media about an ongoing investigation. But folks, this is a hot mess. If there was any criminal investigation that you probably ought not go rogue in as a federal prosecutor, it would be an attack on the U.S. Capitol, arguably an attempt to violently overthrow the United States government to stop the certification of Joe Biden as the duly elected president. That would be the case. I think I'd refrain from going rogue in. Stay tuned to this story, folks, because it has legs, and we'll be talking more about it in the future. In the meantime, please stay safe. Please stay tuned. And I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.